Well, they haven't played here for three seasons, but this Friday and Saturday, they'll be back for two memorable nights. Now this week, leading up to the Aces alumni hockey games, we have a three-part series exploring the Aces road from making history to breaking hearts. Channel 2 Sports Director Patrick Enslow has the story of how it all began. Patrick? Mike, Rebecca, Aces hockey can be traced all the way back to the 1930s when this senior men's hockey team took the ice and played on an outdoor rink on Fireweed Lane. Legend has it they made their own ice in a hot mop between periods but 60 years later, a whole new crop of aces would captivate Alaska hockey fans. It wasn't just a beer league, you know, it was kind of a step up from that. The Alaska Aces are the 2011 Kelly Cup champions. Before the Kelly Cups, before the sellout crowds. We all had jobs in town. We all had to get up the next day and go to work. Before they were even paid to play, it was pure passion for the sport. We needed something to do here locally. We thought there would be a good draw for it. After previous failed attempts to put together a senior men's amateur team, a unique set of circumstances brought hockey back in December of 1990. Uh, there was a Russian team from Harbor Rask in town that got stuck here because of weather, and I got a phone call from the rink one night and said, hey, can you get some guys together to play this club? Local hockey coach Dempsey Anderson suggested Sorensen call his new team the Aces, a throwback to the 1930s Anchorage men's team. The newly formed Aces would skate to a 3-3 tie and lose in overtime to the Russians. We were all ex-UAA uh, and myself being from UAF college players and some uh, local high school players. Following that game, Sorensen would secure ice time, a schedule, and the Anchorage Aces were in business. You know, I was running off my American Express card and off my sporting goods store at the time. and. Uh, it, you know, it was difficult, and we were, we were making do, and the, the, nobody was getting paid. We were just having a good time and put on a pretty good brand of hockey of uh, all former college players. Playing and coaching, Sorensen quickly found out the business of sports is expensive, and he didn't have the deep pockets to keep his team on the ice. The big turning point, I think, was the, the first ownership group that helped me get going. You know, as a player coach, it was difficult to have friends on the team and try to say who's going to play when. But with financial backing, the team would go on to win the 1991 Amateur National Championship in Fairbanks. We ended up playing the Gold Kings in the final and, and beat them 5-2, and they were pretty well known throughout the Senior Men's Hockey League at that time. Building on momentum from their early success, the team would make a name for themselves on the national amateur scene and slowly build a fan base locally. It was tough dealing against UAA at the time because UAA was good. UAA was winning games in the, in the early 90s there and mid 90s. They were having great crowds. And we tried to build on their success, um, just a different type of hockey. We had the fighting, which was really important to people back then. Well, the early days, the crowds were small. You know, we were lucky to get 1,000, 1,500 people. And... Then, in 1993, the Arctic Challenge Pre-Olympic Hockey Tournament would come to Alaska, made up of teams from the United States, Russia, and Canada. The weather was great. You know, it's the first time being in Alaska. Uh, I really enjoyed myself. Team Alaska would also face off against the international talent and had a roster made up of many Aces players. <laughs> Giving the local hockey team a chance to show off its talent among the world's best. You know, it was still, we were all young enough that we still had that, that passion for the game and, and uh, wanted to compete at, a, at somewhat of a higher level than just a local Anchorage men's league, you know. But as 1995 approached, the Aces' days as an amateur team would be numbered, as new ownership eyed a leap to the pros. Tomorrow on part two of our series, The Aces Turn Pro, we take a look at the men's transition to becoming a pro hockey franchise and the growing pains that came along with it. Tonight, Channel 2 Sports Director Patrick Injo joins us with the story of how the team turned pro and what came with that transition. Patrick. Mike, Rebecca, back in 1995, the team then known as the Anchorage Aces would officially become a professional hockey franchise, joining the West Coast Hockey League and bringing a new brand of puck to town. It was just crazy. It was more uh, just slap shot. Getting paid to play is the dream for many hockey players. You know, we're entering a new aspect of our game. We're going to be professionals. That dream would become a reality for many Aces players in the fall of 1995 when the franchise joined the West Coast Hockey League. Uh, it's first day and uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, you know, uh, just like when I used to play, you get a little nervous for the first day and I I'm taking it as a tryout. 
Turning pro also meant the team would look a lot different than the senior men's amateur team for which it was known. We had the long two-week road trips, and, or the, we had one, the longest one we had was 28 days. And, and you know, that's, that's a long, long time to be away from your family. And, you know, it, and it was hard for the, some of the local guys, you know, to, with jobs. But uh, so after 95, a lot of the guys that played in the early years, you know, they just didn't play anymore. As the roster changed, so would the identity of the team. And I, I really, I just think it was something that was uh, lacking as far as just something different. College hockey is a, is a totally different animal, and it's fine. It's not aces hockey. And I think that's what they were able to market, that, hey, that's great, here's something different. The kind of hockey that would end up grabbing national headlines. Oh, well, we started in Fresno. You know, and you know, it was all Fresno and the Aces always had the big rivalry, and there was an incident there that started with Dean Trebojevic and another guy, and that started back in town before we went that road trip. So Dean was kind of in a little bit on a mission, and it started. Him ended up getting charged with assault, and and had to go to jail for a couple hours. We all put, pitched our meal money together and bailed them out. Like that, people go to jail when, when they do that on the street. And they said because they're on the ring, they're, they're allowed to do that. Hopped on the bus the next morning to uh, Bakersfield. So it was quite an interesting way to start a 28-day road trip. On the ice, the team was built around centers Key Street and Dean Larson. I think we just got to come out and forget everything and just Play to win. And the duo played an entertaining style of hockey that fans grew accustomed to watching during their days at UAA and UAF. As their success grew, so did the crowds. I remember the very first time they sold out, Kenny Huzinga, rest in peace, was the equipment manager. He said he would shave his head if the Aces got a sellout, and they did. And it was unbelievable. And he shaved his head on, on center ice, one of the top 10 moments of my career. No doubt about the Aces sports and entertainment value, but a definite question, how long could it last? Those were some good times back then. I'll never forget those days in my hockey career. Now things would start to head south for the franchise in 2000. Tomorrow we wrap up our series with our third installment, following the team's rise from bankruptcy to Kelly Cup champions, to calling it quits. Tonight, Channel 2 Sports Director Patrick Enzo tells us how the franchise went from nearly being sold online to the hottest ticket in town. Rebecca, from losing games to losing money, things weren't looking good for the Aces in June of 2002. The team was $2 million in debt, and then owner Mike Cusack Jr. put the team up on eBay. Eventually, new ownership, a new coach, and a new name would change the future of the franchise. <laughs> Fresh off their worst year in franchise history, things didn't look promising heading into the 2003 season for Anchorage's pro hockey franchise. Uh, first, first season was really tough. We got it in August, uh, started playing in October. We didn't have a coach, we didn't have a team, we didn't have any employees, so it was a real tough first year. A seven-man ownership group, including Terry Parks, had bought the team in the summer of 2002 and had their work cut out for them. We were downtown on the Fifth Avenue a parking garage. Uh, that's where they were. And I remember when we got the keys for that, uh, most everything in there was was uh, pretty well trashed and been picked over. In any line of business, who you hire is key to success. And professional hockey was no different. Davis was the most prepared uh, interview that I've ever done, and I, I probably interviewed 500 people in my life. And he was by far the, the best prepared and, and, and had a plan. Forget about what has gone on in the past. These guys are, you know, taking the steps in the right direction, and, and uh, it'd be an exciting atmosphere to go into. And, and then when Davis Payne came in, things became much more businesslike. On top of hiring new head coach Davis Payne in 2003, the team changed its name to the Alaska Aces and played its first season in the ECHL. By 2004, the team had built a winning culture. Because they managed to keep it a pretty, pretty big secret. Um, you know, not a lot of people knew. <laughs> And soon it would have Stanley Cup talent to match. Plenty of opportunity to go play somewhere else, and it all boils down to uh, I love the state, I love the people, and you know they gave me an opportunity to play here. And what can I say? Uh, 
Uh, who knows? It could never happen again, so I'm definitely going to take advantage Due of it. the NHL lockout in the 2004-2005 season, Scotty Gomez would skate for the Glacier Blue. The loudest the Sullivan Arena has ever gotten was that first year that Scotty Gomez came to play. Gomez would return to the NHL after the lockout, but some of the best years were still ahead for the franchise. We fought just about everything, including ourselves. And They'd win their first Kelly Cup in 2006. The Kelly Cup is coming home! Another in 2011. A group of guys. I mean, everybody wanted it so bad. I can't really explain it right now. Followed by their third and final cup in 2014. You could kind of see it coming. I remember we were in the, uh, heck, third round of the playoffs, I believe, and it was it was exciting, and we weren't selling out the games. Ticket sales and sponsorship would slowly turn south. Could I see it coming? Yes. Did I see it coming that quickly? Absolutely not. <laughs> of 2017, the ownership group announced the franchise would fold for financial reasons. We let them know we appreciated them and we don't want them to leave. A difficult ending for a team that spent decades getting off the ground, but fans enjoyed every moment of the Alaska-grown team's success. Huge part of my life. To have it taken away, it hurt, and it still hurts. Now, the storyline of the franchise really kind of goes full circle when you look back at that 91 roster. Many of those players would go on to coach everybody from Scotty Gomez to Nick Mazzolini, and some of those players on the 91 roster even had kids who won cups in uh, 2014. And if you missed any of our stories in this three-part series, they're online at ktuu.com.